Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this presentation of Gaelic Roots in conjunction with the Burns Library. Um, I'm very excited about tonight. I'm so glad you came out on this cold night. Um, I just, before I introduce Christian DuPont to introduce Helen Phelan, I'd like to just mention that the next um, concert that will happen over in the Theology and Ministry Library Auditorium will be March 19th, which is a big week, right? I know you're all super busy and have full calendars that week. But it is nice that we um, uh, have um, Marina Kazik and Chris Newman, um, harp and guitar. They were here a number of years ago um, when Seamus was directing the program, Seamus Conley. So I'm excited to have them back. They're doing a tour and uh, a stop here at Boston College. So. They're fabulous, so I, I hope you'll keep that in your calendar for March 19th. And uh, I'm excited to have uh, Helen Phelan here tonight, and I'll introduce Christian DuPont, who will introduce Helen. Good. Good. Sheila, I'll step by the podium here for a second. Uh, it's wonderful to collaborate with Sheila once in a while on these kind of events. So we wanted to, when we knew that Helen was coming back to the States again for a second visit this year during a, a bit of sabbatical and uh, and uh, visiting with her son Luke, colleges and, and speaking, Luke is here uh, from Limerick, of course. We'll say a little more about uh, both of them. But uh, in setting up this event, we said, well, this is so natural because it brings together uh, music and text. And so therefore, you know, Gaelic Roots and the Burns Library. Uh, again, my name is Christian Dupont, and I represent the, uh, our wonderful staff of the Burns Library. And uh, Elizabeth Sweeney, our music librarian, is in the back there. Kathy Williams has come back, who's now retired as our Irish music li uh, uh, studies librarian, and many of you know Kathy. Um, and uh, so we're, we're delighted to, to present this uh, event together this evening. Um, so thank you for that. I want to say uh, a few more things about, uh, about Helen and, uh, and about this evening's program. So, Helen Phelan is a Professor of Arts Practice at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at the University of Limerick, uh, where I've been privileged to visit on a good couple of occasions here. It's an amazing place. When you go to Ireland, and I saw John and Mueller Carlson there back there, um, visit uh, uh, the, uh, the University of Limerick and the Irish World Academy, um, and Lenstall Abbey nearby there. You had Richard Carner and <laughs> is in there. It's a wonderful part of Ireland in the, in the southwest there. So. Uh, Helen is a, a research council uh, recipient for her work on ritual singing and new migrant communities in Ireland. And her most recent book, uh, Singing the Right, R-I-T-E, Singing the Right to Belong. So the right, R-I-G-H-T, to belong. It's wonderful. Music, ritual, and uh, the new Irish, published by uh, Oxford uh, Press in uh, 2017. Uh, so the latest book. Uh, and as a singer, as a ritual scholar, uh, Helen specializes uh, in chant associated with religious rituals. Uh, she is co-founder of the female vocal group Cantoral, uh, which released their acclaimed compact disc recording of Irish medieval chant in 2014, and I think we'll be hearing some samples uh, of chant this evening. So um, Helen serves on the editorial boards of several journals, including Frontiers in Psychology, uh, the International Journey of Community Music and Experiments and Intensities, a journal for performance as research. Hmm, maybe not the journal's names you were expecting to hear, but that's because her research are based not only in singing, ritual, and migration, but arts-based and practice-based uh, research methods, uh, which is a unique concept, and I hope you're going to be saying a, a little about that. Um, and even if you don't understand the concepts, Helen is the embodiments of arts practice, bringing together the scholarship, the performance, and the insights that those together bring. And we're really a part of it. This is, a, in a way, an arts practice community here by bringing you know, our minds and our hearts and our, and our ears uh, to, uh, and our eyes to this evening's uh, thing. So uh, another very important thing to say about Helen that some of you know, um, that uh, she worked very closely uh, with her husband and composer Michal O'Sullivan, uh, who um, is involved the founding of the Irish World Academy, uh, and you were involved with that really for Michal from the beginning and doing that um, in, from 1994. And we remember uh, Michal very fondly and dearly this evening and every day here at Boston College as uh, uh, for the many uh, times that he was here and the inspiration he gave to the founding of our Irish Music Archives with Beth Curates uh, for the Burns Library uh, now over some 30 years. So um, you have a right to belong to this podium here this evening. It's, yeah, with real gratitude. I'm glad that you're here with us this evening. 
mute Lucas while here. <laughs> Having visited home many times. So thank you. Thanks, Please come here. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's just it's a it's a lovely honor for myself and Luke to share this space with you this evening. This is the, the first time that I've really talked about some of this work publicly, so I'm, I would love your feedback. Please jump in at any stage in the middle if you have any questions or comments or you feel like singing with me, I would be very happy for you to do that as well. And I thought maybe before we kind of jump into the presentation, we might actually begin with some chant. And the, um, lots of the miracles of the Irish saints were either announced or prophesied or even carried out by angels. So I thought we might start with a chant to, to an angel. Um, Patrick's guardian angel came to visit him for the 40 days in the desert, as we were told in the medieval sources. When St. Bridget was a small baby, a druid saw a vision of three angelic presences who anointed her and carried out the order of baptism. The angel Raphael told St. Senin when it was time to go to Scattery Island in the Shannon Estuary and defeat the monster who was living there. As a small child, St. Brendan, you can see in this image here, was fostered to St. Isha. And St. Isha used to see angelic presences around his head. When St. Ciaran of Clonmacnoise went to study with St. Finian of Clonard, he was required, as all the students were, to take his turn at grinding the corn. But when his turn came, an angel would come and grind the corn for him so that he could study and pray. But the most powerful angel of all was the archangel Michael. Michael is the protector angel, the guider of souls, and it's not a coincidence. Many of you will recognize this Skellig Vihil, Skellig Michael, now of course of Star Wars fame. It's not a coincidence that this island is near a smaller island called the House of Don. Don the God who gathered up the souls of the dead to bring them to Tir Nanog, to the land of eternal youth. <coughs> um, as Christian was saying, and I thought that it would help me, being back here in Boston tonight, that I might begin a chant tonight to the Archangel Michael, to call Michael into our presence, uh, to call Michal into our presence. The last time that I was here in Boston, it was with Michal and my son Luke, and this image of Michael, of Michael, uh, many of us will be familiar with the icon of Michael slaying the dragon, wouldn't we? Uh, this, is, this, this icon is more uh, typical of the Eastern representation and resonates, I think, a lot more with the role of Michael in the Irish tradition as the protector of the world. I'm going to introduce this chant with a little reading from the Book of Lismore. And this, this reading is about when St. Brendan, who of course, as we know, really discovered America, so we don't have to uh, talk about that tonight. We're all in agreement there. But when he sets out from Kerry, not far from Skellig, to find the Isle of the Blessed. So I might just read this text and then sing the chant of the Archangel Michael coming down. This is, I'm not checking my messages, I'm finding my piano. <laughs> Brendan heard the voice of an angel from heaven who said, Arise, Brendan, for God will give you what you seek, the Isle of the Blessed. And he saw in a vision a mighty, intolerable ocean on every side of a beautiful, noble island, with angels rising up from it. I will be with you, said the angel, and I will tell you how to find the Isle of the Blessed. Concursum est mare et contere muite Michael, descende bate cielo, concusum est Come 
So just a, a few words about the chant and the style of chanting that I'm singing. As, as Christian mentioned, I sing with a group called Cantoral at the University of Limerick in Ireland. And we're especially interested in those medieval manuscripts that we have in Ireland or that we find in continental Europe about Ireland. And what we try to do is to create our own editions and to perform and record these. So most of what I'll be sharing with you tonight is based on the scholarship of that group on those editions with a little bit of, of modal improvisation. So what I'd like to share with you are some some insights about the late medieval records that we have of the miracles of the Irish saints. And as I was saying, I first came to this topic myself as a, as a singer. One of the, the striking features of these medieval Irish manuscripts are the chants and the offices that we have about the Irish saints. And um, most of these are hagiographies uh, from the Greek holy. They're like holy biographies. And these are the stories of saints' lives that emphasize the miracles and the wonders of their existence. And several of the chant sources that we have for Patrick, for Bridget, for Colum Kill, for Colum Banis, for Chiron, come from the late medieval period, from about the 14th or 15th century, these stories. So I thought that it would be interesting to look at some of these lives of the saints from the same historical period. So the one I'm going to talk to you about tonight is a, a 15th century manuscript called the Book of Lismore. And there's a collection of these lives of the saints. So before I dive into these sources, I think one of the things that's worth thinking about is that our contemporary understanding of miracles differs quite a bit from that early medieval understanding. Our view of a miracle is as something rare and extraordinary, isn't it? It's like the occasional intervention of the supernatural into the natural order. But that view is actually a product of the late Middle Ages. To understand the view of the early medieval period, what the Irish saints would have been thinking and reading, we need to look at writers like Augustine. We know, for example, that Columbanus was very familiar with that work. And Augustine's views of miracles were not that they were occasional, but that they were normal. For him and for the early Irish saints, all of life was continuously infused with the miraculous. But it's only the occasional few who are aware of this. So miracles are all around us, but we can't always see them. And the holier a person was, the view was, the more predisposed they were to be able to see these. And of course, this corresponded with the view of the time that there wasn't this separation between the natural and the supernatural world that we now think, is there? So for example, paradise was viewed as terrestrial. Now, there was a lot of debate as to exactly where it was. You know, was it in the, in the mid-Atlantic? around the Isles of Atlantis, was it Brendon's Isle of the, of the Blessed? Um, I have to tell you that Isidore of, of Seville suggested that one thing we were pretty certain about was that purgatory was on the island of Ireland. <laughs> so, but, but the majority opinion was that paradise was probably somewhere in the east. And connecting paradise with the East evolved out of, of course, the growing commercial relationship with the East and the spice trade. And this view of the East as somehow being cloaked in a sense of the marvelous. And it's really interesting that the Book of Lismore, this, this manuscript that has the lives of the Irish saints, also has one of the earliest Irish language versions of the adventures of Marco Polo, the book of the marvels of the world. And the sources from this early period suggest that the marvelous or the miraculous was all around us. And when they talk about a hagiography or the life of a holy person, it was somebody who was attuned to the marvelous. 
So if we look generally at the view of miracles at this period, what we find is that there are three main categories. And this is not unique to Ireland. We find this right across the medieval sources. And there, there are miracles of healing, uh, miracles of protection, and miracles of hospitality. And we find examples of all of these in the lives of the Irish saints. So uh, not surprisingly, lots of these miracles emulated the, the miracles of Jesus. So in terms of the healing miracles, the book of Lismore tells us that Patrick raised the dead, healed the blind and the lepers and halted every disease. When a boy is killed by a snake trying to cross the river to hear Colum Kill preach, he makes the sign of the cross on the boy's head and he's brought back to life. Um, Twelve lepers are sent to Chiron. He cuts a sod of ground out of the earth. A stream gushes forth. He pours three waves of water over the heads of each of the lepers and they're cured. Columbanus restores the sight of a blind man in Aurelion by touching his eyes and he casts out the demons from a Parisian by grasping his ear and striking his tongue. There are many, many more examples of these, of these miracles, as there are plenty examples of what we call protection miracles. Sometimes these are miracles of the saints protecting others. Sometimes the saints are protecting themselves. And in, in many of the cases, there's a small little edge of revenge against the people who are trying to attack. So when robbers try to kill Curon, he strikes them blind. When a soldier tries to kill Columbanus with his lance, the soldier's arm becomes paralyzed. When warriors from Fear Reach come to slay Patrick, they are drowned. When three sisters from Bridget's household go to Rome and the guest keeper tries to poison them, they sing the hymn that Colum Kill wrote in Bridget's honor and they're all saved. So we have, we have plenty of examples of these healing miracles, the protection miracles, but by far the largest category of miracles are miracles of hospitality. There are lots and lots of variations of the water to wine miracle, the loaves and fishes feeding the multitude. Uh, when Patrick was a little boy, we're told, his mother scolded him because all the other little boys were bringing honey home to their mothers. So Patrick ran out and got some water and changed it into honey. <laughs> One day, Finian of Moville is celebrating mass and he realizes he has no wine. So Chiron dashes off, gets some water, <coughs> pours it into the chalice and transforms it into wine. Uh, Columbanus feeds 60 hungry monks at Fontaine with two loaves of bread and a little beer. Like our mir miracles of protection, there's also a frequently a consequence for those who do not render hospitality. When Senin asks a king to share his feast and the king refuses, all the food for the feast is turned putrid. There's no <coughs> doubt that the saint most often associated with miracles of hospitality is Saint Bridget. And we'll turn to Bridget for our next chant. Um, the book of Lismore, the, the, the manuscript that I'm referring to tonight, has 62 miracles associated with Bridget, and 24 of these are miracles of hospitality. For my um, images of the saints, I have I've all these beautiful um, Harry Clark. Um, I have a particular love of stained glass, and I had a wonderful tour around the campus with Beth today, so I had to go back to my hotel and quickly change some of my slides to put in some of the gorgeous um, images that, that I found around here. As a young girl, we're told St. Bridget was traveling with her nurse to see her father when the nurse takes ill. She asks a man who is preparing a feast for some of his ale for the nurse and he refuses. She goes to a well, turns the water into ale, and turns all the ale from the feast into water. <laughs> One Easter, Bridget wishes to brew some ale for all the churches around her monastery, but there's a scarcity of corn, and she only has one sieve of milk, but she's able to brew enough ale for 17 churches from Maundy Thursday to Low Sunday. Once Patrick comes to, Bridget, to visit St. Bridget, and she wonders how is she going to feed him and all of his followers. She only has one sheep, 12 loaves of bread, and a little milk. She blesses them and she can feed Patrick, his followers, and all of her own congregation. Within the hospitality miracles associated with Bridget, what's very striking is the number of milk miracles we have in the Irish tradition. Of course, we're only a few weeks past the festival of Imbolc, aren't we? Christianized as, of course, the feast of, of St. Bridget. And many of the rituals from the pre-Christian feast associated with lactation and fertility are present and it's very striking to see the continuance of these metaphors in Bridget's hagiographies. 
We're told one of her sisters becomes ill in the church and she desires milk. Bridget finds some water, turns it into milk and heals her sister. When a group of bishops come to visit Bridget, she's no milk left because she'd already milked the cows twice that day. But she instructs the cows to be milked a third time. They give their best milk yet so abundant that it creates a lake of milk. It's very interesting because there are feminist medieval scholars like Caroline Walker Bynum, for example, who remind us of the important connection between the medieval female mystics and food. But the relationship is strikingly different for the majority of medieval sources compared to the Irish sources. The typical relationship between medieval female saints and food is one of fasting and deprivation. But the Irish one is one of hospitality and abundance. Of course, hospitality, uh, sheltering the guests, feeding the guests is a very important aspect of the medieval Irish social fabric, um, legislated for as early as the 8th century. Bridget's hospitality is strongly linked to, of course, the ubiquitous association with cows as an example of wealth and status and abundance in early Irish society, but also of the life-sustaining food source of women themselves. Milk is always also a very important metaphor for the transition point from the old Celtic religious world to the new Christian one. And I'll talk about that in the next section. But now it's time to sing again. I'd love to do a Bridget chant for you. And this comes from a manuscript that we have in Trinity College in Dublin. It's called TCD 80. And this tells that lovely story. Um, many of us are familiar with that honorific title that was given to Bridget, Mary of the Gales. And this tells the story about how she's, Bridget is called to a synod in Leinster, and the, actually I'll, I'll read the story from the, from the Book of Lismore, actually that might be nice, and I'll use that to come into this chant. Virgo decorato. Mm -hmm. Bridget was invited for a gathering of the Synod of Leinster. It was manifested to, Saint, to, to Bishop Ivar, who was at the assembly, that Mary the Virgin would come to the assembly. Bridget went to the assembly, and on seeing her, the bishop declared, but this is the Mary whom I beheld. And the whole host blessed Saint Bridget, wherefore she was henceforth called Mary of the Gales. Virgo decoratu. Stabat Nova Brigida Stella Micabat Sacra Corus Plaudit Quia Signum Celi Tu that we've discussed, the miracles of healing and protection and hospitality. As I said, these are quite common across medieval sources. But there are other miracles which are actually quite distinctive to the Irish tradition. One of these is the sets of miracles around 
the transition between the pre-Christian and the Christian world. The first very often to recognize a saint were the Druids of the old faith. Uh, we're told that St. Senin's parents, for example, a humble peasant couple, pass by a gathering of Druids. When one of the Druids stands up to give them homage, the rest of the Druids laugh, but he replies, it is the child that is in the womb to whom I give this homage. Similarly, St. Bridget's father and his bondswoman drive past a Druid's house on their chariot, and the Druid declares, marvelous will be the child that is in that <coughs> womb. As a baby, Bridget refuses to eat any of the Druid's food, so he sets aside a red-eared cow who is only milked by a faithful Christian woman, and this milk is the only food, we are told, that the child Bridget will consume. At the baptism of Brendon, three purple fish jump out of a well, reminiscent, of course, of the purple spots on the belly of the salmon that has consumed the hazelnuts of wisdom at Connla's well. The sacred trees of pre-Christian Ireland, the oaks, the rowan, the hazel, and the holly appear as well in many of the miracles. A man presumes to take some of the bark from the great oak under which Column Kill used to take shelter, and he is struck with leprosy in a tale similar to the fates meted out to those who dare to interfere with the fairy trees. When St. Senin is born, a rod of rowan held by his mother bursts simultaneously into fruit and flower. And when drought comes to Scattery Island, he thrusts a holly stick into the land and a well appears with a full-grown holly bush beside it. It's really interesting, I think, to note that in this same manuscript source, the Book of Lismore, which contains, as we said, the lives of the saints, the adventures of Marco Polo, but it also contains a part of the Fenian cycle called Tales of the Ancients of Ireland. And it's the story of Coilche and Oshin, the nephew and the son of Fionn, traveling across Ireland with St. Patrick, telling him the stories of Fionn and the Fianna, the old faith literally telling their stories to the new. So I thought we might turn to Patrick and his miracles for our next chant. This is a source known as the Dublin Troper. Um, this was produced in the 14th century. It's particularly associated with St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. Um, it, it, it contains, among many other chants, some of the most beautiful sequences that we have to Mary in the Irish tradition and two sequences to St. Patrick. You can see it's written on parchment. It's, it's got a beautiful um, red and blue capital decorated flourish there. Um, I'm going to sing the second of these sequences and um, the melody for, if there was such a thing as a chart topper in the medieval ages, it would have been this tune. We find this melody in, in almost, in, right across all parts of Europe in many, many manuscript sources. The tune is actually most often associated with a Christmas, a Christmas hymn, and it's only in the troper that we find it associated with St. Patrick. And it's, um, it's a sequence that is full of the stories of his miracles. Sequences have two lines of poetry with the same melody, then another two lines with a different melody, and so on and so on. <coughs> so in this particular one, we hear the miracle of the, the water turns to honey of St. Patrick. Um, his mother is looking for some fire, so as one would, he runs out and grabs some ice and transforms it into, into flames. There's the miracle of the, the thief who stole a goat and ate it. And when Patrick asked where the goat was, of course the thief denied it, but the goat bleats from the stomach and <laughs> reveals his true um, fault. And then, of course, the story of, of Patrick banishing the, the snakes from Ireland. So I thought I might give this one a try. I'm just going to get a small bit of water there. Let's have one this. There's a myriad Irish sing aloud, or the joyous hosts of Ireland sing aloud. Leta bundus de conte hibernicorum se tu sea totus mundus colau de regem Mente pia, quis 
salutis nuncium, hiberni patricium, destinavit, docet evangelium, erreros gensilium, confundavit. Canamus miraculis, plenum acunabulis, Christi vatem, aquam in mel transtulit, qui nutrisem contulit, sanitatem, glacierum framina, pereus pira, Fragia ad sempiterna nos gaudia. Jump in any time if you've any <laughs> questions or, 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 or comments. So, um, one of the other, I think, really, really fascinating and distinctive aspects of the Irish miracles is their relationship with nature. Again, this is in contrast to a lot of the continental literature which frequently portrays the natural world as the devil's playground. Nature, especially the nature of the flesh, was to be rejected. But the Irish saints have an affinity with nature and a distinguishing feature of the Irish miracles are, for example, miracles associated with animals. So one day Patrick is herding his sheep and a wolf comes and takes one. His mother, there's a lot of, a lot of Patrick's mother in these miracles. She laments the loss of the sheep and the next morning at Patrick's request, the wolf appears and brings the sheep back unharmed. One time St. Bridget is boiling five pieces of, get of bacon for her guests when a miserable hungry hound appears and moved by pity, Bridget gives him two of the pieces of bacon but when the guests arrive, the five are there. St. Chiron was regularly visited by a stag who allowed him to use his antlers for, the bo for his book when he was studying and praying. Wild ducks follow St. Colmon wherever he goes. St. Gall's most steadfast companion is a bear. Columbanus, we were told, frolicked with the birds and the squirrels around his shoulder and hidden in his cowl. Colum Kill sat down at the side of the road at the age of 77 and told his companion Dermot that he would die that Sunday, whereupon his horse burst into tears. And of course, Colum Kill's name is most asso often associated with the Dove of Peace, and we can see that as well in his iconography. This next chant, again, is a very beautiful one, I think, it's, and it's from a Scottish source, the Inchcombe Antiphon, a 14th century um, manuscript, which has many chants to St. Columba. With Patrick and Bridget, Colum Kill was considered one of the three great patron saints of Ireland. 
Um, of course, though highly disputed now, St. Patrick's grave was said to be uh, at Downham Cathedral. And by the early medieval period, the tradition had developed that Columkill and Bridget were also buried in the same place, giving rise to the well-known couplet, in Down three saints, one grave do fill, Patrick, Bridget and Columkill. <laughs> this, this, this is a lovely chant. This is chant says that God, wishing to calm the laments of humans, coaxed Columkill out of his cave to sing, and the dove brings the olive branch of peace. Let's see, can we give this one a try? Roland. Uh, Patrick and his mother and another uh, striking feature of the miracles of the Irish saints are actually miracles associated with mothers and this is I think a really intriguing aspect of early Irish Christianity illustrated I think in this image from the book of Kells the, re the relationship between Mary as mother and child is a very strong motif in early medieval Irish spirituality. We find this, of course, concurrently in Eastern sources, but it's noticeably absent in the Western Church at this period, where most of the iconography and the visual art is about Mary the Virgin or Mary the Queen. And so ubiquitous did images of the mother and child become in late medieval art that it's very difficult for us to appreciate how novel they were in the early medieval period in the Western Church. There's only one surviving Western book that contains an image from this period of the mother and child that is not part of a larger nativity scene, and it's the Book of Kells. And the importance of this relationship, I think, is mirrored in lots of the examples we have of the miracles of the Irish saints. We are told that St. Patrick conducted his first miracle in his mother's womb. A son of the King of Britain came to visit his mother and she offered him hospitality by washing his feet and entertaining him, whereupon his wife became jealous and gave poison to Patrick's mother. The baby in the womb seizes the poison, makes a stone out of it, and is born with a stone in his hand. Colin Kill's mother 
was the first to have a vision of his greatness. While he was still in the womb, she has a dream that she's given a mantle of every radiance and hue, but it's taken from her by a young man in her dream. But the man tells her not to grieve, for this means that her son will fill Ireland and Scotland with his teaching. Bridget's mother was told that her daughter would be born between one world and the next. One morning she goes out at sunrise with a vessel full of milk in her hand. She puts one of her, foot, her feet across the threshold and brings, gives birth to her daughter, neither within the house or without, and then washes the child with the milk that is still in the mother's hand. Quite a feat. Uh, Brendan's mother has a vision that her breasts are full of gold and shine like the sun and the bishop tells her this means she will give birth to a great son. Patrick himself prophesizes the birth of Saint Senin to Senin's mother telling him that her son will be the Patrick of his people. These familial images bring me to my penultimate chant that I want to share with you today. It's, it's one of my favorite chants about uh, family and also about education. So I think it's, it's a fitting one for tonight. And um, most of the saints' lives that, that I've talked about and those stories I've, I've taken from the saints, the live saints from the Book of Lismore. Um, and most of the lives in that manuscript are from saints who lived in Ireland, Patrick and Bridget and Brendan and Ciarán and Colm Kill. But I wanted to, to include a chant from at least one of the medieval Irish saints who established monasteries across Europe because we have so many beautiful chants from those, those sources as well. The most famous of these, of course, is the monk Columbanus. And, and the story of, from his life, this is from a hagiography from a very early ones, about 640 by a monk called um, Jonas of Bobia. I, I, I included this image because this was the international stamp that you might have got on your, on your letters from Ireland um, in 2015. Uh, commemorating his, his death. And Columbanus, of course, is associated with one of the earliest manuscripts, the Antiphonary of Bangor, that gives us information about the, the Celtic liturgy. One of Columbanus's great companions was was, was St. Gall, after which St. Gall in uh, Switzerland is named. And this chant tells the story of when St. Gall's parents uh, bring him to Columbanus to be educated. That's there, as you can see, Garland and Columbanus there in their little boat. And it says, the parents entrusted their brilliant son in the prime of his life to Columbanus. I, I think it captures the love of, of God's parents and also the role played by, by Columbanus as his mentor. Parentes vero beati gale. Give this one a try. Parentes vero beati gale filium su. Tatis flore nim tentem cum oblatio. Magister 
Rio. There are enough miracles recorded from the Irish saints to fill several evenings of stories and chants, but even I think the small few that we've been able to share here this evening shed a light, I think, on the values of the societies who recorded these events as wonders. The actions that are held in high enough esteem to be recorded as miracles are acts of hospitality, especially to the needy, an affinity with nature, its flora and its fauna, and the human relationships of the family. These were the acts of wonder which have come down to us from that time in story and in song and perhaps inspire us to wonder about the values of our own time, what counts as the miraculous and the wonderful. So I thought I might finish tonight with um, what is probably one of the oldest chants that we that has survived extant from medieval Ireland. This is a chant called <coughs> Ibu Sancti, which is preserved in a 13th uh, century French manuscript. It's a text of a song of the monk Theobald of Bobbio, who sings it on his deathbed, and it's recorded in the life of Columbanus. And when I did my little tour with, uh, with Beth this afternoon, um, I just was... <sighs> the wonder of, of Patrick, Bridget... Colin Kill, Brendan, going forth in virtue, from virtue to virtue, to be seen in Zion. I had to run home and change my slides and, and add this one because I thought it was a marvelous. So if it's okay, I'll just I'll I'll read the, the, the text from the life of Columbanus and then maybe we'll finish with this with this chant. Ibu Sancti. When he had said farewell to everyone, he himself began to sing the antiphon. The saints will go from virtue to virtue. The God of gods shall be seen in Zion. Once the melody of the antiphon was finished, happily and with every pleasantness, he returned his soul to his giver. So that we who were standing by were given to understand clearly that he was filled with joy by the glory of what he had seen. Ibu Sancti De Virtute In Virtute Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Vi debitur Deus Deorum in Sion. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Oh. Uh...